Let us bow our heads together and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this morning with grateful and thankful hearts. We praise you for who you are. You are the one true living God, the creator and sustainer of all life. You are perfect in every way. You are holy, holy, holy. You are righteous and just and merciful. And Father, we are grateful this morning that we can come together. And Lord, that we share in a common cause, and that is to worship and lift up your son, Jesus. And Lord, as we think about this week, we want to thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us during the week, Lord, and throughout the year. We want to thank you for Jesus and what he has done on our behalf at the cross and what he's doing even now interceding on our behalf. And I pray, Lord, as we get together this morning to come under your word that you would uh, enable us, Lord, to set aside all the cares and the thoughts that we have of this week and that our hearts and our minds would focus upon you and your birth. And Lord, that we would not get caught up in all the worldly desires of things that are going on in this world, Father. And their health and their age and all, Lord. And we just want to lift them up to you and ask that you would bless them this morning with your word and we pray that you'll continue to keep a protection around them, and Lord, that uh, you would heal up those who are not feeling well. And we're very grateful and very thankful this morning to see certain ones back this morning who have been ill and are healed up and doing well. And we just want to thank you and praise you for that. And we ask now as we come to your word, Lord, open our ears and our minds and our hearts to you. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9 this morning. We will be looking at verses 1 through 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. In Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. You have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and the garments rolled in blood we use will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase, increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it, judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. My people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. It's a very familiar uh, passage that we're looking at this morning. I want us to think about this concept of darkness. And I want us to think about the reality that our world is in darkness. Think about Israel and what it's going through, and the Ukraine and what it's going through, the wars that are going on as we speak, and other conflicts around the world and problems around our world. Even domestically, the problems that we face of different kinds. Certainly, can we all agree that on some level, there is darkness in our world? 
But there's actually darkness in ourselves. You ever heard somebody say, I've been in a really dark place? Have you ever yourself been in a really dark place? What does somebody mean when they say they've been in a really dark place? Well, they usually mean something of something along the lines of sorrow, or they've been in, they're in despair, or loneliness, or discouragement, or hopelessness, those kinds of things. And the Bible calls that darkness. In fact, in Isaiah, same book we're looking at this morning, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 30, it says, And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea, and if one look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow. And the light is darkness darkened in the heavens thereof. It associates darkness with sorrow. And then this passage says, My people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. And we, we've gone through this passage before, and we've gone through, it's been several years now, we've gone through, the, through some of the backstory that we're going to look at this morning. There is what we really need to do in order to be able to receive the light that God wants us to have, which of course is Christ. I think we need to do three things. First, we need to understand the problem of darkness. We need to really understand the problem of darkness. We need to realize the effect of light. What does, it, what does light look like, especially in contrast to darkness? And we need to trust the source of light, which of course is Jesus. Let's first understand the problem of darkness. It says, my people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. And we know from the Bible that darkness has different ideas associated with it in Psalm 69, 23, it says, let the, their eyes be darkened that they see not. Lamentations 5, 17 says, for this heart is faint, for this, these things, uh, their eyes are dim. So blindness, dimness of sight is associated in the Bible with darkness. In Psalm chapter 82, verse 5, it says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, a lack of understanding, a lack of belief, a, a, an ignorance, that, kind, that is darkness. Uh, death is associated with darkness in the Bible as well. And what we find, if you'll, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to go back, we're going to backtrack a little bit, and we're going to go back to chapter 8, and then we're going to go back to chapter 7. So if you'll take your Bibles and just flip one page back probably in your Bible to chapter 8, I want us to see, we have a great example of what darkness looks like. The people of God, Israel, is in darkness here. The reason that, that is important to understand, I, what, what's, what's going on here is that Isaiah, God is telling Isaiah, don't, don't be in darkness the way Israel is. And he's going to now describe what, what Isaiah shouldn't do, describing also what Israel is in. And we're going to see several things that will help us to really get a good picture of what darkness is in this passage and the kind of darkness that the people of God, God's people, Israel, found themselves in. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11, it says, For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand, it's talking about Isaiah here, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying... Look at verse 12. Do not say a conspiracy concerning all the people call all this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hollow, him let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. So what is darkness? Well, it's fear and trouble. And we're going to see that even more clearly in chapter 7. We also see that God actually becomes a stumbling block for the person who is in darkness in verse 14. It says, He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, to both the, to both the houses of Israel, talking about the northern tribe of Israel and Judah, the southern tribe of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and and, among, uh, and many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken, bind up the testimony, seal the law 
among my disciples. You have fear and trouble. God actually becomes a stumbling block for the one who is in darkness. And you think God, of course, we know Scripture says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And what we're going to see is the, the need for the presence of God. And God is everywhere, but you can be in darkness even though God is is all present. How is that? The next verse is going to help us. Verse 17. And I will wait on the Lord. He who hides his face from the house of Jacob, I will hope in him. That really helps us understand what darkness is. If God is light, darkness is when God hides his face from us. You can think of it this way. You're walking along with someone and They turn to you and you have their full attention. You have their face, if you will. When you when you have when you're looking at someone's face, you can communicate a lot with them. You know if they understand what you're saying. You have a better idea of what they're saying. It's very helpful to talk face to face with someone, to really communicate, to really relate to them. But when God turns his face, he may be there, he is there, he's all he's everywhere. But when he turns his face, we we are in darkness. And then when God's face is turned and there's blindness and dimness of sight and God becomes a stumbling block and all of these things happen in darkness, then we find in verse 19 that they're plunged even into deeper darkness. Verse 19. When they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, shall not a people seek their God? Shall they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to the word, it is because there is no light in them. Look down at verse 22. Then when then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Now the law in the Old Testament was very clear that, there, that they should not practice divination and soothsaying and those kinds of things. But when there is a total blindness, when you don't know, when you're not receiving any kind of revelation from God, you are bound to want to know what is going to happen and some sort of direction in life, and you resort to things that otherwise you never might resort to. Think of Saul. He did that, didn't he, King Saul? When he, was, when, when he turned his back on the Lord, when there was darkness in Saul's life, he turned to other evil places for direction. And the Bible is very clear in Le- Leviticus and Deuteronomy that this is something that is completely prohibited um, scripture says, for example, in, that, in, in Deuteronomy um, chapter 18, verse 12, for all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for th- these n- nations which you will uh, dispossess. Listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Now, the question is, I think, I think that we can all agree that the world's in darkness. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, there's darkness inside us as well. We're born with that darkness. Um, but how do we deal with it? What, what, what are the ways that people try to deal with it? Several years back, the New York, New York Times had this saying, talking about Christmas, the meaning of Christmas is that love will triumph and that we will all be able to put together a world of unity and peace. How are we doing on that? <laughs> I mean, are we uh, doing real well there? This was several years ago, and I don't think we're any better off now than we were back then. Um, That article goes on to say, in other words, we have the light within us. So we are the ones who can dispel the darkness of the world. We can overcome poverty, injustice, violence, and evil. If we work together, we can create a world of unity and peace because we have light within us. The Bible says something different. (laughs) 
The Bible says that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Our hearts are dark with sin. And it is God who is the light. How is it that someone descends into the place, that place of darkness? How did Israel do this? Well, flip back one more chapter. How did Israel get into a place of darkness? Well, they had a king, more than one, but Ahaz uh, seems to really, really exemplify getting plunged into darkness. They had a king who really led them. Uh, of course, this is the southern, southern, Israel, southern uh, uh, house of Israel, Judah, who led Judah into darkness. So right around 735 B.C., the northern tribe of Israel formed an alliance with Syria. And we're going to see that in the passage. So Syria and uh, the normal, normal tribe of Israel, uh, they form an alliance with each other because Assyria... With, uh, the, with King Tiglath-Pileser III, that's a fun thing to, fun thing to say, They're, he's, he's, he's coming after people, and he is creating an empire, and he actually is successful at doing so. Well, they're forming an alliance to be stronger together than apart, and they try to pressure uh, this man, Ahaz, King Ahaz, to form their alliance as well. But when he refuses to do that, they are now going to bring mili military arms against him, in order to really, very likely, their plan was to depose him and put in their new king and then set up an alliance with that particular king. And so Ahad, Ahaz, he's afraid of his own, he's afraid of what's going on. He's afraid of these two kings. And so we pick up in the passage, and I want us to do this. As we, as we read through the passage, you're going to, and look through the passage, we're going to see a descent into darkness on the part of this man, Ahaz. And what we're going to see is that God calls, is, call, calls uh, Isaiah to come to Ahaz and to offer him warnings and signs. We're going to see this as we go through the passage. And as God takes steps to reach Ahaz and to, sh to offer his presence to Ahaz, Ahaz takes steps away from God. We'll pick up here, and we're going to see the first descent in the darkness is deep fearfulness. Ahaz is deeply fearful. Verses, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, and Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia. So pick up there. You've got, uh, you've got Pekah, who is the, the uh, king of Syria, and Rezin, who's the king of Israel, uh, northern Israel. Um, and... Uh, uh, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. Ephraim was a prominent tribe uh, in northern Israel. So they made the alliance. You can see the alliance there. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pools. Now the aqueduct, probably what was going on was uh, Ahaz was concerned that they were going to lay siege to Jerusalem and the aqueduct was supplied water and he was probably concerned that they were going to cut off their, their water, that this alliance was going to cut off his water supply as a way of getting him to surrender. Um, verse 3, continuing on the, on the highway to the fuller's field, and said to him, take heed and be quiet. Why? Do not fear. Isaiah says to Ahaz, do not fear or be faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands of the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramalia. Isaiah by the words of God, says to Ahaz, hey, you do not need to be afraid. Clearly he was. Don't be afraid. He calls these two nations that have formed together an alliance. He says, to the, he says they're stubs. They're not going to last. Don't form an alliance with them. Don't, but also, don't fear them. Because what he's going to do next is out of fear. D don't fear them. Deep fearfulness is often a gateway 
to darkness. And then we're going to see, secondly, rejection of divine assurances. He rejects divine assurances. Verse 5, it says, Because Syria and Ephraim and the son of Ramalia have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its walls for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. He's very, God is very clear. This will not happen. It won't come to pass. You do not, Ahaz, you do not have to worry about this. Now, God, I want, I want to pause at this point, because if you read through the book of Isaiah, you're going to see that God does execute judgment and punishment and those kinds of things. But, and there are some people that they sort of say, well, how could God be so, you know, so vindictive? And God isn't vindictive. He's just. But, but how could God be so that way with these people? But actually, God, you're going to see this. God is extremely patient. And he is going to give warning after warning after warning after warning. He's going to do everything, uh, everything that, that is thinkable to be able to get Ahaz and Israel to turn to him and to desire his presence and to walk with him. Everything that you could possibly think of, God is going to do. And, Isaac, and Ahaz and the nation of Israel are ultimately going to reject it. So we see in verse 9, it says this, and the head of Ephraim is, is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. Uh, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. There's a gracious warning here. You, look, if you don't believe me, then actually you're the one that is not going to be established. Your kingdom will not be established on earth. And then God is even more gracious and more benevolent. We see in verse 10, Moreover, the, law, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself. Would you please believe me? <laughs> Ask a sign for yourself, for the Lord your God. Ask it either to, in the depth or in the height above. He's like, you pick a sign that will work for you in order for you to believe that what I say is true. You pick it. Pick whatever you want. In the heavens and the earth, you pick it. Is that not gracious of God? I mean, i I got to be honest with you. I'm not that gracious. <laughs> I'm, not as, I'm, not, I'm not that gracious with my kids. I'm like, how many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> right? God is extremely merciful. He's extremely gracious. He says, would you just... So he offers this. Well, this man is not going to take him up on it. Ahaz is not going to take him up on it. Instead, instead, this man is in such darkness that what he does is he actually takes Scripture, takes the Bible, and twists it, takes it out of context and twists it in such a way to make a rationalization for what he wants to do, which isn't to desire to believe in the presence of God. Verse 12, But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. And in the Old Testament, we find that, that's, that the Bible says, don't tempt the Lord your God. Of course, that is God is saying to, to Ahaz, tempt you, test me. This is a little different situation here. God is saying, show me, a, you know, I'll give you a sign. So he rationalizes by using scripture. This man is in deep darkness. Now, God is so gracious and patient, and God also has another plan, and another thing going on in mind as well, a prophecy for the distant future, that he gives him a sign anyway. <laughs> Look at verse 13. He won't ask for a sign. But he gives him a sign anyway. Verse 13, it says that he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? He points out, he's like, um, you know, you're, will you actually do this to God? Verse 14, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Okay, he's going to pick the sign now. 
He will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's the prophecy that we're going to see in the New Testament, the book of Matthew. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, this word virgin, virgin in the Old Testament, it, at this point, it merely means, it can mean virgin the way we would think of it, but it, it could just mean a young woman who's unmarried yet. Okay, that's what it, now, um, we're going to find actually that in the New Testament, the Greek word, when it quotes this, is clearly virgin. It's the only way to take it. And the Greek, actually the Greek, tran, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, also uses the actual word virgin. So God very likely has some, I mean, we know, not likely, he does have something else in mind here. But also, God, I think, does give him an immediate sign in the person of the son of Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. Now, this is debate, some of this is debatable, but it looks to me like God answers that, that immediate um, prophecy of a sign to Ahaz. Look at Isaiah 8, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord, Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz. That's the son of Isaiah. And I will take for myself faithful witness to record uh, Uriah the priest and Zechariah uh, the son of Jerabarachiah. Jera uh, then I went to the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Masher Shal Hashbaz. For bef before, you, I don't know that anybody's going to name their child that. That's not that common. You know, you have Daniel and David and not this. Um, for before the child shall have knowledge to cry my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. Now, then we see that this is a fulfillment in Matthew. Okay, this is going to be, there, there is a future fulfillment of this. Take your Bibles. We're, this is a little bit of a, we're, we're going to come back to the story here, but just take your Bibles and turn to Matthew for a moment. Keep your finger in Isaiah Turn to Matthew chapter 1 and look, verse, look at verses, verse 18. You're going to see the fulfillment of this prophecy completely, the total fulfillment of this prophecy in that passage. Look at what it says, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of the Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the house of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, a, the, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, you marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord with, through the prophet, saying, Behold, virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and, shall, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now there's a lot there that's the best, one of the most detailed, or the most detailed description of the reality of the virgin conception. Jesus was conceived by a virgin. There's no doubt about it. All of those details are in there about how this all happened so that it would be clear that Jesus, that the, that the Holy Spirit moved upon Mary to produce uh, Jesus uh, who, would, who would be born of a virgin. Now, what happens to Ahaz? Go back, let's go back to the story now. What happens to Ahaz? Ahaz goes his own way. It's the best way to, he's in darkness. We've seen that. He doesn't, doesn't choose a sign, doesn't listen to the sign. He does what he wants to do. And we find in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 7, it says, so Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who rise up against me. So Ahaz now, he what does he do? He says, well, the enemy of the, my enemy is my friend. And instead, he is so afraid of this alliance with Israel, northern Israel, and Syria, that now he's, he's going to side with Assyria 
who is actually the main problem. And he makes an alliance with Assyria. He goes his own way. He is convinced that this is the only way, or the best way at least, to be able to, to remain on the throne. But if anybody, if you know anything about Tiglath-Pileser in history, you know that Ahaz is not going to remain on the throne. In fact, Ahaz ends up being having to pay tribute. He ends up being just a puppet king, basically. And, and uh, it, it's basically, Assyria ends up uh, assimilating southern Israel, Judah. Why, in 2 Chronicles, we see some of this. Uh, 2 Chronicles 28 17 through 19, you can look at that later, but I'll just explain why, what it says here, verse 19, for the Lord brought Judah low because Ahaz, king of Israel, for he had encouraged moral decline in Judah and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. Ahaz plunged the nation of Israel, or the nation of Judah, into darkness. Now, if we, we'll know a little bit more about this man Judah from 2 Kings chapter 16. In 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, we won't take the time to turn there just for sake of time because we have some really important things to get to, but I'll just simply say this, that this man is a, an extremely idolatrous man in that chapter. In fact, he sacrifices his own son to idols. This is, his, this is the kind of wickedness that this man did. It's the kind of darkness. How is it that a king of Israel could plunge into that kind of darkness? Because the world is dark and his heart is dark. And he needs, and he rejects, he rejects the light that God is offering to him. And this is not a surprise to God. In fact, John chapter 3 verse 19 says it this way, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, that's Jesus, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. In Matthew chapter 6, it says it this way, verse 22, For the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? It's talking there about the heart. The darkness of the heart that, that view, that cannot see the light, rejects the light of God. Now, what we then need to understand, we've seen the darkness. Now let's ask the question, how do we deal with this darkness? We can't look inside of ourselves. That doesn't work. I mean, New York Times is dead wrong. How do we deal with this? Would you take your Bibles and turn back to Isaiah chapter 9? Isaiah chapter 9. And we'll see verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And we know that's Christ. Those who dwell in the land, and by the way, it's, it's said in past tense because it is surely going to happen. It's, it's, it's in the future, but it is... It is so, it's so confident that it's going to happen, it says it as though it's already happened. Those who dwell in the land of the, dark, of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. We pick up here, and we're going to see exactly what, what light looks like. In other words, what is the effect of light in a nation in, a, in the life of a person, what do we see? Number one, we see increase. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased the nation. Number two, we see joy. We see joy. You've increased its joy. They rejoice before you. And it gives two illustrations of this. Like the joy of a harvest. Now, we're not, you know, we don't, we're not farmers here, most of us, if any of us. 
Some of you do have some pretty cool gardens. And there is something really cool about harvesting things from a garden, right? You get, you get pretty excited when you start seeing things come up from a garden. But if you can imagine your entire livelihood and harvest comes, and right before harvest, you're a little nervous because you, know, you, you, know, you, know, you hope these plants do well. When you put seeds in the ground, you're hoping everything does well because this is how you survive. This is how you live, and you've got to get enough in, in harvest to be able to sell and be able to preserve and do all those different things. And when the harvest comes and it's a bountiful harvest, you are, you are thrilled about it. There's great joy, rejoicing. And the second illustration here is men rejoice as they divide the spoil. In times of the spoils of war, they go into war and uh, they war with, with uh, you know, two, two, and the, whoever the victor is is going to get all kinds of valuables as a result of that. There is joy. This is the kind of, this is the result of walking in the light. John chapter 15, verse 11 says it this way, these things have I spoken to you that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4 says this, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Jesus has come, and his desire is for those who will call him, uh, who will receive him, that they will receive joy. And freedom. Look at verse 4, Isaiah 9, 4. For you have broken the yoke of, your, of the, his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. It's uh, referring probably both to the time where uh, he was, they were freed from Egypt and also uh, the time of Joshua when they were freed. There is great freedom. And Jesus says that the Son, therefore, will make you free, John 3, 36. You'll be free indeed. And then verse 5 says it says victory. Victory is another, another result of the light coming. For every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and the garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. That's a reference uh, to, to the destroying of the weapons of the opponent. Uh, you actually could see in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. We won't take the time to turn there either, but you can write that down. Jesus... It, it, the idea is that, that God will destroy the weapons of the opponent so that they're useless. Speaking of victory, 1 John 5, 4 says it this way, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if someone's walking in darkness, hopelessness, I want us to think about this, lowliness, despair, oppression, what is it that they really need? They need light. And how, what is, let's think about this. Just think, think about it. Somebody comes to you, just practically, somebody comes to you and they says, you know, I am feeling really, really lonely. I'm in a dark place. I am feeling extremely hopeless. I am, I am in despair. I don't, see, I don't see how I can go on. Those kinds of things. What do they ultimately need, ultimately? Now, I'm not saying it's the only thing that they need, but it is ultimately what they need. You know what they need? They need, what if there were, what if there were someone who knew exactly who they're, what they're going through. Exactly, exactly. Do you know why sometimes we're in a dark place, in a lonely place, a place of despair, a place of hopelessness? Because hopelessness, we really feel like nobody really knows what we're going through. And you know what? Sometimes we go through things that it is, it, we, I mean, it is, it is, in a sense, it is unique because, because I'm me and I'm going through this and there's only one of me. So there is a sense of which it's unique. But what if there was someone, what if there was someone who, who literally knew exactly what you're going through? And what if that same person was, was extremely open with you and loving toward you? What if that person had absolute ability to do anything, anything? What if he cared for you so much that that he's like a father to a child 
and he cares for you so deeply. What if that same person, he is going to deal not only with you and your relationships, but everybody around you, he's going to deal with all of that too. And he's going to make your circumstances and your everything peaceful. Do you think that would help you in your darkness? There is such a person, and there's only one. His name is Jesus. Now let's look at the passage, and you're going to see all of this. Look at the shining light in verses 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. First of all, we know that to be Jesus. We see two things there. First of all, it says a child is born. So this child is born. But it says a son is given. That means that there is a humanity and also a divine gift there, a deity involvement there. And the government will be upon his shoulder. He's going to rule. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from th that time forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we have here a description of the light. Who is this light? This light is Jesus. Now, we're going to, we're going to delve into some more of this next Sunday. But I want us to see some things here. The light is Jesus. We find in 1 John chapter 1, uh, verses 5 through 6, this is the message that we have heard of him and declaring to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. In John chapter 8 and John 1, we have Jesus as just described as light. We're going to see that more next Sunday morning. He's described there as light. But when we think of Jesus and the why is he light? Because we have the opportunity to have a relationship with him. And, and it, it's so special because of who he is. So I want us to just take a minute and think through these. He is, first of all, wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. That is, Jesus is extremely personal. And he is one to be awed at the same time. Now, you, you know, you don't usually put those two things together. You, you, you might put someone who's really, really personal, personable, and, and somebody who's, you know, you're just in awe of, right? But usually you don't put those two together. And yet Jesus is the one who is full of wonder, he, the one to be awed, and yet he is the counselor. He is the personal God. He is the wonderful counselor. The word counselor has the idea of to convey plans, dreams, aspirations of the heart. This is Jesus. This is one, you know, there are some people that they don't know how to have that kind of relationship. Right? Some people that they're friendly, but they're going to hold you at arm's length a little bit. They're not going to convey their dreams and their aspirations. They're not going to show you their heart. Not Jesus. Jesus does show us his heart. He does convey his plans. He came down to earth and to do this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says it this way, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. And, G and Jesus went through every kind of suffering imaginable. Loneliness and rejection and, and everything that you can possibly imagine. Jesus went through it. Dorothy Sayers, who was a British essayist and novelist, points out that there is mis much misunderstand or much confusion about why God allows suffering. But she actually says this, she says, although that may not be completely understood, what we know is that God took his own medicine. Jesus was one who suffered greatly. He is the mighty God. 
Jesus is powerful. He has all ability. So you have this friend. The Bible says he is our friend. And you have this friend who is personal and who is wonderful and he is one to be awed and yet he is also all-powerful. He is the mighty God. And he's the everlasting father. He is the protector and the provider. He, is, he provides care, fatherly care for us. He cares for you. And he is the ruler of all. He's the prince of peace. And although the world is in darkness and the world is in turmoil and there is no peace, Jesus is the prince of peace. And one day, Jesus will establish his kingdom and there will be peace on earth. 2 Samuel chapter 7 Verse 12 says, I will establish his kingdom and, on, and the, the throne of David will, will be forever. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Now, the question then becomes, how do we receive this light? How, how, do, we, how do we have this light affect our lives? And we are going to look at this more next week on Sunday morning. But I want you to take your Bibles for a minute and turn there. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and we're going to look just briefly at this now, and then we will delve into this next, next, uh, next Sunday. John chapter 1, verse 9 says this. John's going to pick up this theme of Jesus being light. And John is one who very, by almost all descriptions, is the closest to Jesus of all the disciples. He certainly is one of the three closest to Jesus. Very, very relational. And his writings are very relational. And he picks up this up and he says, verse 9, John chapter 1, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But... As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. That is, when Jesus came down to this earth, what he is mighty God, came to this earth, was born of a virgin. Took on, was clothed with humanity so that he was completely human as well, suffered, went through all of the agony of humanity and the temptations and the suffering and all of that that we go through. And he died, took our sin on himself, and he died for us. And the Bible says that we, everyone on this earth, has the opportunity to receive him, to receive the light. And those who do, the Bible calls them children of God, sons of God. But we'll go one step further. Flip over several pages to John 15. He says we're children of God there. Those who will receive him as their Lord and Savior were children of God. Now remember who this Jesus is that we just talked about. And notice what Jesus is going to say to his disciples, verse 12 of John 15. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than, a, than, a, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants. Why? Why? For a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. He doesn't, he doesn't, a servant does, a master doesn't convey his heart and his plans and all that to a servant. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have known to you. The song got it right. There is no friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. And 
then God said, John later on in his epistle says this, what we need to do, John chapter 1, verse 17, if we will walk in the light as he is in the light, Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship, one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is joy. This is light in our lives. This is Jesus, the friend who everybody wants to have. He's the best friend anybody could have. So we have three questions to summarize all of this. Number one, how are you dealing with the darkness of the world and in your life? How are you dealing with this? Well, I try not to think about it. <clears throat> I turn off the news, not a bad idea, but not the answer. I just think that we'll all get together and like the little light in you and the little light in me and the little light in everybody else will all come together and we'll make this one big light and we'll sh shove out all the darkness in the world. But how are you dealing with the darkness of the world and in, in your life? Christ is the light. Number two, do you have the characteristics of light? I mean, I just take a minute and think. Do you have these characteristics in your life? Do you have increase in joy and freedom and victory? Are these things true of you? There's two reasons why they may not be. You may not know the Lord, but also you may not be in fellowship with the Lord. First John is clear that he wrote so that we can be in fellowship with him so that our joy may be full. We'll talk about this more. Do you have these characteristics? And number three, will you receive the light by trusting, depending, and relying on Jesus instead of yourself? What was Ahaz's problem? Ultimately, Ahaz's problem was that he was depending on his way, himself, rather than depending upon God. God, him, God gave him every opportunity imaginable to, to depend upon him. But instead, he chose to go his own way and depend upon his plan to do what he thought was best, even using scripture to twist. He right? twisted scripture in order to be able to do what he wanted to do. And that was the bottom line. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. Because he was walking in darkness. Will you receive the light by trusting, depending, and relying on Jesus? Trust the Lord with all your, all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. If you are here this morning and you don't know where you stand with the Lord, you don't know if you're a child of God, you don't know if you really receive Christ as your Savior, you're not sure, let me, take, let me encourage you to come and talk with me afterwards. You could talk with others that were up here. You could talk with somebody that you're comfortable with and you know they have a relationship with the Lord. I'd be glad to take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure what, uh, that you are a child of God. And maybe you're here today and you are a child of God. You know you are. But you're not experiencing joy and, and, and freedom and victory. You're not experiencing the kinds of things that the Bible describes that you should be experiencing. That doesn't mean you're free from all kinds of trial. It doesn't mean that you're free from all kinds of difficulty. Jesus wasn't, didn't, that didn't happen to Jesus when he was on earth. Every trial and difficulty imaginable Jesus went through. It's not that. It's that there is this joy because you have this friend. <laughs> like no matter what you're going through, you have this friend with you that you just know it's going to be okay because you have this friend. I mean, I, I hate to use this illustration, but I will, but, you know, like these cheesy Hallmark movies where everything turns out wonderful because they met somebody, you know, it doesn't work that way because not, nobody's that great or perfect, good-looking and, and wonderful and, you know, perfect and, like, all that. But Jesus is the friend that you can have so that no matter what you're going through, it's like you're, there's this inner joy 
because Jesus is your friend. He's the light, and he's the answer to our darkness. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you, and we thank you for the truth in your word. We thank you for the, for the light of Christ. We would, surely we would be, of all men, most miserable without this light. We thank you that you've given us the opportunity to receive it. We thank you that for the joy and the peace and the freedom and all those things that we can have despite what we're going through oftentimes. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to, when we're tempted to go our own way or to do what we want or to resort to our own path, Lord, would you help us to rem remind us of the need to depend upon you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hello, my name is Jim Ganam, Senior Pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for streaming our service. We hope and pray that it was truly a blessing to you. You know, we live in a day where we have access to the preaching of God's Word with just a phone or a tablet or with a couple of clicks on our computer. But we really would love to meet you in person. You know, there is just nothing that really replaces the experience of being in a loving community. Here at BBC, you'll be greeted by people who genuinely want to help you to have the best experience you can possibly have. If you have a family, we can help your kids find their fun, interactive classes, and your littlest ones can get settled into our safe, fun, and well-equipped nursery. Then help yourself to a cup of coffee and join us for the main service for singing, praying, and the preaching of God's Word. Although we'd love to have you visit our church, this is not our greatest concern for you. Our greatest concern is that you know how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to let you know about a resource that will help you with this. It is called The Exchange. The Exchange is an easy-to-use, four-week guide that helps people to learn how they can have a relationship with God according to the Bible. If you contact us, we'd love to give you a copy while supplies last, and we'd also love to meet with you either in person or over the phone or over a FaceTime or Zoom video call so we can walk you through this helpful resource. If you're interested in going through the Exchange Bible Study with us, or if you just have a need we can pray for, please email us. May the Lord richly bless you. We hope to see you soon.